they are living on the water in an interesting way. Um, the Dutch have built their homes right onto the water's edge, or on Amsterdam in particular, but also other places. They are planning to build floating urban blocks, not just floating houses, but floating urban blocks in Rotterdam, their old part of the harbor. And they will be here to sell us that. I predict 10 years they'll be selling us infrastructure for floating urban blocks. And these houses that they place right along the water allow them to live with what their slogan is, is live with the water. Um, these kinds of houses are actually built uh, on stilts in um, areas where uh, they're contained by berms and they get flood storage by having uh, the freeboard to allow flood water to be stored in here. They can take another two, three, four feet of water in these. So people would live the same way, your, your access is from a road on one of these berms. But this kind of mini polder um, allows people to live in a flood storage area. While it's always wet and always beautiful, it can also get deeper without forcing them to evacuate. So it's an interesting idea. The edge of the structures the Dutch built, though, is, as I said, not particularly biologically impressive. A lot of algae, that's about it. The, the sand motor or the beach that they've built is the most interesting ecologically because it's actually creating a lot more habitat. Those beaches aren't being bulldozed so that they have time to develop birds and plants and other kinds of things that live on them. But most of the Dutch examples really don't provide much habitat. So I've been working with colleagues like Julie Bartman to think about how we could make an edge that in some cases may need to float submerged um, because maybe the sediment's not available or maybe we need to be able to make it flexible in a reversible experiment. Um, or maybe it's someplace where the sediment have been contaminated. So we have a lot of these places where it's not necessarily appropriate to build on the bottom, but where we could do other kinds of things. Um, I think that here in the Bay, one of the things I've noticed, and I can say as an outsider, which probably people can't say as much who are actually consulting here in the Bay, um, this is a little bit of a light slide, is that the Bay's position, the shoreline position, is a dynamic thing which is very recent. Not only is it recent because of the filling in the 1950s, but it's recent because of the actual geological development of the bay, where um, only 10,000 years ago, and since I have a geology degree, it is kind of an only that we say, only 10,000 years ago, uh, the bay edge was here. And then uh, something like 5,000 years ago, it was here. And presently, it's somewhere around this solid line. This is a, a study from 1977. Um, but What's interesting is that our current shoreline is fairly arbitrary. It was an amazing success to stop the filling, but where it stopped wasn't necessarily an optimum position. So it's something that I think we have to consider. Where are we at with the edge of the bay? It's a very artificial bay. Um, all of these activities and uh, dynamics have changed the bay. We're not talking about a pristine water body by any means. So it seems to me that um, we should give some thought to what the potential is of the bay in other ways as we adapt, and not just show maps of the land being inundated by the bay, but show maps of the depth under the water. So we can make that part of how we think about it, in section, if you will, as well as in plan. And you can see that a lot of the bay is very shallow. This just shows this light col color for less than five meters, but a lot of that is much less than five meters. So there's a lot of potential to change the shape of the edge. Um, and as I said, a lot of the work that's been done on wetlands, this is um, maps produced by the Baylands Habitat Goals Project back in the 90s, a lot of the work they've done to restore wetlands um, is going to be submerged. And we have a big question about how to resolve this train wreck. Will we protect housing with levees and leave everything else to be inundated? Or will we try to find some way to mix habitat and development as we do protection? Um, the interesting project that the people have been doing trying to restore parts of the salt ponds, uh, recently studies have come out by both USGS and by um, independent scientists saying that there's not enough uh, sediment to be able to raise the level of the salt ponds to an intertidal level even for today. And that it would take much longer, we're talking centuries here, to get to raising the level to where it would be if sea level rises at all. And of course, this is one of those BCDC maps everybody's been showing of the inundation of this large area. Um, I think it's too much to give up. I also think that it's important for us to consider uh, proposals from the conservation side, like the horizontal levy that the Bay Institute has proposed, and think about incorporating it. 
not just seeing it as a wetland edge on a levee, which is what they've basically proposed. They, they use data from other people saying that if you have a little bit of wetland edge, you can get a lot of storm attenuation, you can get a lot of um, wave attenuation in different conditions. The spring tide, um, uh, a storm that has a 50% chance of occurring, and a 1% storm. You can get a lot of attenuation, and that's a good thing. And they've started making drawings showing a levee with a big wedge of wetland. Uh, that's brackish, close to the levee, maybe fed by wastewater, maybe fed by other kinds of stormwater, um, and then the salt edge on the edge of that. But I think we have to be more aggressive still about what they're thinking about because I'm worried about having New Orleans with a big wetland edge. I think something more aggressive has to happen. Um, they're also talking about costs. I'll kind of skip over that because Dillip has, has helped us understand a lot about costs. Um, they think basically that the wetland edge, the horizontal levee is cheaper because by adding that wetland, you don't have to make the levee as high. That was the point of their cost study. Um, I'm showing here an example of Foster City in the interior. It's very artificial. I could have shown an example of uh, Bell Marina Key. Bell Marin Yeah, in, in Marin County. I'm sorry, Bell Marin Key in Marin County. And uh, a lot of these artificial approaches to thinking about housing in a flooded area are kind of similar to what the Dutch have done, but more of a single family ranch house, big yard kind of version, not the modern housing version that they're talking about. You notice that there are artificial beaches in here. So we're already doing a kind of a, a, kind of a protected berm, micro polar approach in some of these places, but the size of the berms isn't sufficient to adapt to the new conditions that we're gonna face. And I just wanted to show this again to remind people, we can do this on a small scale. It doesn't have to be all of Foster City. Um, we could do smaller areas as tests for this. And what I'm thinking about, uh, because I don't have to worry about getting clients and work in the Bay Area, is uh, talking about the possibility of looking at an edge. This, is, of course, is the, um, the airport in Oakland, and then uh, down here on the way to Hayward. You can see there's a real mixed edge of some development some wetlands, some parks. Uh, it's a very mixed edge and not necessarily optimized. It's stopped and has been regulated at a certain point because sort of the clock ran out on the 1950s plan, not because it was optimal. If we looked at that edge and thought of it as a place to reconsider how we would have wetlands, conservation, or recreation, um, beaches, which add to our wave attenuation, and housing, um, and I say this because as I look at the rest of the country in particular, not even the rest of the world, just the rest of the US, coming from the East Coast after Sandy, working in the Gulf Coast after Katrina, we are gonna see amazing housing pressure in the Bay Area. If we don't have a massive earthquake in the next 20 years, we might, not gonna wood, we won't. If we don't, people are gonna look at the Bay Area as one of the more stable parts of the United States in terms of summer temperatures, in terms of storms, um, in terms of fire. Even. And they're gonna say, if we can afford it, let's move there. We're gonna live, we wanna live on a coast. Let's live on that coast. So we'll have even more housing pressure than we have now. If we reconsider that zone, and we think about how does new housing generate funds, the way Dillip was talking about for uh, Treasure Island. I'm not saying I've optimized the locations of the housing, I'm just thinking about a pattern here. How could we introduce some areas of housing that are actually in floodable berms that are always wet? The interior of this microfolder is always wet, but there's room for storage for flood water. We add the horizontal levees on the outside of the berms that protect those microfolders, and we add sand for beaches, not necessarily from natural sediment movement, but from dredge. I think we have a chance to develop an artificial shoreline that actually would be something we could use to move our shoreline forward and back as we need to. But we have to go beyond the idea that you can't fill. We have to start thinking about optimization. Um, and that's something that I think is really important as part of the conversation. I would err on the side of the Dutch approach, which is, you know, build it now and interest rates are low and no one else is doing it yet. At least do a reversible experiment or some kind of experiment to learn from what you can do and find a way to make the private sector pay for it because the public sector is not gonna have money. So everybody in the country is gonna be asking for money at the same time as climate changes. You can already see it. New Orleans got some money, then New York gets some money. Wherever the fires are or floods, they'll get some money. 
if we all start asking at once, there isn't enough money. So I think we need to prepare ourselves locally to do something out of our own funds and think about managing something like microfolders instead of letting each community, nine counties is what uh, people are always saying here from the Joint Policy Committee, um, and all the cities and towns within those counties, uh, that to me feels like an impossible governance structure. So how can we come up with some other governance structure that's driven more by people with a vested interest in their local, the local performance of things like berms and uh, floodgates and other kinds of structures that are important to maintain. So I'll leave you with that thought.